welcome back, everybody. My name is Lancelot Tola, I'm from PINET, and I'll be hosting this afternoon session. Next, we have four amazing presentations focusing on the enabling technologies in future fairway and remote pilotage. We will begin with Mark Markus Alström from Bright House Intelligence, followed by Hanning Zhao from Tampere University. Thirdly, we have Mika Komu, Mika Komu from LM Ericsson, and last but not least, Henry Suonimi, Mayer Turku. But now I would like to invite Marku on stage. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. All of you, it's good to see so many familiar faces here in the audience. My name is Marku Salvo, and I'm the Managing Director of Bright House Intelligence. Bright House is a company developing remote and autonomous solutions, <coughs> outdoor, indoor, offshore, you name it, and we'll be there. But today's topic is the, the technical approach to the intelligent fairway and the remote pilot. It's as a, a special use case and topic there. And if I start a little bit from the, the history, how, how we started, the mission for us was that we are sort of technology developer and also data provider to, to other parties in, in the program. And we were dealing with the, firstly with the fairway, the, the existing data what we have there on the, on the fairway, we were having a really good relationship with VPS, so big thanks to those guys that we got an access, for example, the radar data from, from them, and then, and then we designed our own sensor stations there to, to sort of maximize the, the coverage and, and the data what we can collect from the fairway. And then the other, or the second approach was the vessel itself and all, all the data that was gathered from, from the vessel. And the third was then the, the workstation for the remote pilotage and, the, and the, for the remote pilot remote herself to work with. And of course, it, it, it includes the connectivity solution and, and also the cybersecurity solution for the whole system. And that's how it all, all started then. We are a bunch of engineers, so we like to build things, we like to test things. And this is now on our first sensor station located in, in Iris, on Turku Fairway, and we are still having that, that one up and running, so we are monitoring the traffic coming, coming into Turku and going out, out from, from Turku. And we have been testing there various kind of cameras and, and some, some weather stations, current sensors, that, that kind of stuff and all, all kind of different sensoring technologies and, and also the, the computing, or we can say that needed computing for, for the data handling on remote locations and, and also then the, the cloud services that, that is sort of the, the core of the whole system, but I'll, I'll come to that back a little bit later on. All right, this one. So basically the, the system without going too too deep into the technologies that how they, they have been done. The, as I said, the core is the cloud where everything is, is running, but then we also have, have local machines, a lot of sensoring, a lot of interfa interfaces there. But the basic idea was that, that we and the remote pilots and, and all the other parties in the program can, can have an access to the, to the data via the cloud. So there, there's, or, or it's a simple interface that you can get get data out, out of the system. And we have been connecting, if we're starting from the, the bottom left corner there, the vessel itself, and that, that connection is done remotely. We are using the LTE technologies because we have been operating near to the shore. We can also use satellite communications on the basis, but basically we, we operate it all only in cellular <laughs> networks, and same applies to the, the fairway, the, the sensors there. <clears throat> so we, we use there also, also these modem, LTE modem <coughs> solutions, and, and we have been using at least two modems parallel in, in every place, so that we can then optimize the data feeds and really ensure that we have a connection up and running all the time. And then, as said, we also connected the, the VTS information there, so we, we got an information of VTS radar targets into the, our, our system, so we are not relying on only on our own sensoring, but we, we also got pretty good radar coverage then. And then various, just, just like a, an example, like weather services, but you can connect various kind of, of inputs to the system. And then we are feeding all, all the data into the remote pilot center there, <coughs> uh, 
and as stated, it was freely available for all, all the partners working in the in the program. So, Mark, can we ask uh, questions already? I guess. Why not? Or yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, you said you use you use mostly LTE. For what do you use sat satellite? We didn't use in that in this okay. one, but we, we have been using it like going further to the outer sea, so then we, we can use satellite also there and combine that as easily to our system. So it doesn't matter that which kind of modem you connect there. <coughs> so what do you see in the future? Will you use more satellite then? It, de it depends where we operate. Mm -hmm. I hope that, that Heidi and the others are, are really getting full 5G coverage for us in, in the, the fairways, really. So we can use those. But we all know that they go to do the ocean miners and that kind of things and uh, only satellite there. Okay, just some images taking along the way from the sensor stations and, and uh, the data has been used, for example, the universities for developing the image recognition algorithms and that, that kind of thing. Things. So then moving on, because I guess we didn't have anybody. <laughs> okay, good. Some, something to. Okay, that one. So this one's one of, one of the final sensor stations because the original plan was that we are going to run the, the demo on Helsinki, Western Fairway there. But we got a last minute change and change that to, to Pokkola, so, so we never actually used this one. This is taking, it takes place in Lauttasaari and we have one on the other side, similar kind of, of station there. But it, it, it was, was never, never used for the real purpose then because as said, we went to the Pokkola for, for demoing. <laughs> Okay, then, then moving to the demo itself, so, so luckily we, we got ESL, Etelasom and Laiva, also involved in the, in the project, so they sort of borrowed us a couple of vessels to, to develop with, and, and we have had our gear on, on board of Haga almost a year now, so we have been collecting data from Haga a little bit, well, like a, roughly one, one year and testing all the systems that all, all the modems, all the connections work and all the database is flowing. And we give us so, sort of as, as a backup there and, and actually we, when the, the demo was held and, and it was changed to Kokkola at the same time, the Haga was changed to, to Viki and we did the assemblies day before the demo and then we run the demo. And also in that sense it's been pretty, pretty good. So, but you can also hear from this that it's not too many assemblies on the vessel which are really needed to get the data flowing out of that. Can I have one question? Yeah, sure. The weather station and the station you had outside Helsinki that's supposed to be uh, under demo. Mm. Uh, what kind of, of information would the pilot get from that station? From weather station, of course, you get the temperatures and especially the wind, the direction and the, the speed of wind. Okay. Camera. And then cameras. Also, the camera camera views from the sensor station, and you can check visually that hey, it looks like this, and the vessel is going there. The original plan was that we don't have any cameras on board of the vessel, but because we lose the sensor stations because of Coppola, so we assembled one camera there just to get some image of what, what we are doing there. And this is now <coughs> the, the view from the bridge of, of Viki. After the as assembly, so there's a one box. We have some computing power there, and then we have two modems and antennas located on the both side of the bridge to really optimize the, the connections. And of course, in, in the real life, they would be outside, but in the demo, it is perfectly okay to, to have them indoors. And actually, we have been running the, or oh, measuring when the vessels are going, for example, to, to Kokko and, and Rahe, and then they are moving to to Öxelösut in, in Sweden. So they are, they are going in quite, quite not so near of the shores, and there are pretty good connections between Sweden and Finland, actually. There are some black spots in, in round Ahvenanmaa, Åland, that we are losing the connections, but otherwise it works pretty, pretty well. <coughs> and then the remote pilot center itself, it looks like this. And here in the bottom are the main tools for the pilots, the radar, the ethics, and the conning display. And those are directly all the data is coming from, from the, the vessel. 
So we are getting those from the, the buses in the in the bridge and then feeding it, it to the our system. And then we have there on the on the top left corner we have the information of the vessel which we are piloting. It can be something else, you can then choose it whatever you like. And then then the lower one, this is like the prediction tools from awake, but then you see it's going back through in the later on the afternoon, so not touching that. And then we have the sort of situational awareness view where, where, where you see the AIS targets, but you can also see the, uh, the radar targets coming from BTS, but they are now missing from this Coppola view, but there are a bunch of those other targets coming from BTS. And then we have the, the sensor station, station cameras, but this is now actually from the, the bridge of the VK, this one, but basically they are there. So this is how the, how the, the setup looks like. And this is then actually the, the demo. So as I said, the vessel was in Coppola, and there was uh, the whole crew on, on board of the bridge as, as they should, and there was also a pilot there on board who was doing the piloting, as Sanna was mentioning in the morning. So we, we didn't actually really remote pilot it, it but it, they were, there was a real pilot doing or taking the, at least giving in charge of the piloting. But at the meantime, we had had a remote pilot here sitting in, in Turku, in Novia premises. And, and he was all the time giving pilotage commands to the other guy there on the bridge of Viki. And, and he was then receiving those and monitoring that how they are then going hand in hand with the real pilot and remote pilot. And they were actually touching it really, really well. And this is now the, the original view from, from Helsing, so it's it's more more busier there. There, as you see, more more, more targets there on, on the map. <clears throat> but basically, there's still a lot to do, of course, and, and there are a lot of things that needs to be done, like in, in safety point of view, that they, they should be like multiplied and, and, and that kind of things that we, we can add like fail-safe solutions on, on place. But to, to, to be honest, if, if you ask from us, do we really have a concept in, in technology point of view that we are able to do remote pilotage? So for that one, we can then probably answer yes, we do have that one. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience? <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is that was 4G enough? And yes. The second one. Okay, thanks. And the second one is um, um, how easy or difficult do you think it is to install equipment in the fairway if you think about you need to find a location, electricity? What's your experience? Yeah, if I still continue a little bit for, for the first. You ask the 4G. So for many, for many purposes, it's perfectly okay. It's mainly like how you optimize the data flow. Because 4G, especially when you're in good coverage, is it's, it's, it's really fast and reliable. So it's it's okay. But then in, in the second one, you are really right. It's it's quite hard when you go further out to the sea that where you can find suitable locations for the sensor stations, the electricity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But luckily, the VTS is already having their bunch of stuff. So if, if and when all, all these are getting more popular, so I, I guess those are then the ones that, that are relied first to, and, and then then it has to be then then taking care of. It. Of course, the one thing is that how much power you consume, what kind of equipment you can take there, how you charge your batteries, etc., etc. But all those are then evolving all the time, so we're getting better, better and better solutions. But it's it's going to be hard the second one. Yes. Yeah, one question. Do you have in mind any idea about the average of latency while sending data and receiving data? And also, have you used any security uh, measures or you are just like relying on the network to be secure? You mean the latency of the communication? Yeah, yeah exactly. What yeah, is the yeah, average? Yeah, the average is that with, with this kind of system, having all the clouds and all there, we, we are getting with a couple of seconds of latency. 
overall or the total latency there, which is pretty okay for for seafaring. But it is okay for the remote pilot yes. you know, like a couple seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for the security? For security, all, all the systems that we built built there, they are they are hardened, so we, we don't rely only on, on what network coverage maybe or the protection is there, but we are building our own systems there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, so my, my question <laughs> is uh, follow, follow up to Hades, so in a sense, so who should invest in making the fairless intelligent? <laughs> is it the government or, or should it be privately done? Yeah. So, sorry, I, I know it's No, no, we are waiting for the money. We can build it. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> takes the money to the table, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one last question, Ira. For the Connie display, are you getting both actual information and then the command as well? For this one? Yeah. Uh, it depends how, how you you define it. Basically, now this is like the information that what is going on there. But basically, you can add if you mean commands. So if somebody you, if you get, for example, the throttle position and then what is the command for the throttle? With this one, we use the... I guess we have both there. Don't shoot me, but I think we have both them. But at least it can be configured so that because the information is available on the bridge anyhow. You have to stand before the yeah. pilot to see what's what's going to happen next. So. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. And next we have Miss Annie Shaw from Tampere University. Talking about operational maritime cybersecurity visualization. Welcome. Yes. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Anita. I work as a doctor research in Dunbelly University. And uh, today I would like to share with you about our work based on this operational maritime cybersecurity visualization. So the operational cyber security in maritime is kind of challenging, and the dig uh, digitalization has has increased the efficiency and uh, uh, intelligence in the maritime industrial, and both IT and the OT um, technologies have been used to facilitate the operations in maritime. But it also open, opens more opportunities to the cyber risks and uh, also attacks. So the operational cyber security management in the harbor and the fever area is still quite an uh, important factor. Considering the increasing of cyber attack that uh, target those IoT devices installed in the age, and also both new and legacy systems associated with those critical infrastructure infrastructures in the in the terminal area. So, which makes the cyber security program can also affect the physical safety. So the panorama of the models stakeholders in Merida is still quite complicated and uh, also um, uh, um, although the safety issue, uh, issues has gained a lot of attention but the cyber security has not been fully integrated into the different stakeholders mind. So the cyber security institutional awareness which refers to the, uh, the understanding of the current security situation in the operational environment and uh, also the associate risk and the threat is still quite low in in the maritime industry. There also is lacking those effective tools to monitor the cybersecurity stress in the harbor and the fever area. Uh, in a such multiple stakeholders environment that different stakeholders get involved and also they may have different background of the cybersecurity knowledge. So uh, that also makes the security incident handling and uh, mitigation is, is been quite challenging and uh, the communication and uh, cooperation among those different stakeholders may not be very effective. That they're still requiring those standardized ways to report and uh, exchange cybersecurity incidents in this scenario. So, the, mm, so to uh, increase the cybersecurity situation awareness, the data, uh, the data visualization has been widely used to achieve this goal. So the terminology of the cybersecurity visualization is the graphical 
representation of the cybersecurity related information like the network traffic data or the cyber threat or attack. So the, um, the mango of using the visual elements such like chart and ma maps is to support the human users to deal with this massive uh, security data and uh, also help them to understand better like what is going on in their current situation. So the operational situation of the security visualization is also aims to, to achieve the same goal to improve the understanding of the, the cyber security situations of the running devices and the systems in the, in the maritime industry. And also the using this virtual representation can can support different maritime actors in daily operation, decision making, and also for the cyber uh, security cooperation. So, more specifically, there are different uh, stakeholder roles uh, get involved in this harbor operation. So, the first one is the terminal operators. So, they are physically present in the harbor area and they are responsible for, for daily operation. And um, they are users, they are. They, no, they usually have very limited knowledge of the cybersecurity. And uh, the other two roles there from the cybersecurity teams, like the security analysts, they are kind of like professional users. They, are, uh, they were responsible for investigating in cyber threats and attacks. And they're also reporting the incidents and share those incidents reports to managers and uh, operators. So, so the role of manager there belongs to the same security team as security analysts, like as one of the, uh, can, be one, uh, can be from one of the stakeholders. They are also responsible to handling those incident reports from the, uh, uh, from the analyst and the community with others. So they may have some like um, IT knowledge or, or some knowledge about uh, uh, cyber security, but uh, they also more, Folks on um, the communi um, communicate with the, with the other stakeholders. So regarding the cyber security co cooperation, um, we we analyze like two scenarios in like according to the uh, the workflow of incident exchange. So in first scenario, there is an internal <coughs> incident. Like for example, the terminal operators they can. If they notice anything abnormal in the harbor area, so they can report these issues of devices or running system to the analyst. So after the analyst make some investigation or analyst or analyst the uh, like uh, what's happening to this device, if they confirm the incident, then they can share this report to the manager and also the operator. So in that case, the, the operator can also share the this kind of um, report to the port authorities also. So um, in the second scenario, it's the external incident. So in this one, it's, so there might be some other uh, malware attack is going on in another port. So in this case, the manager, they, might, they may get the uh, such alert like from other manager or the uh, port Authority. So in this case, they can share the incident report to the uh, security analyst. So in this case, they can inform the analyst to evaluate the cyber security situation in the current part. Like, do they share some similar risks, or is some devices have some vulnerabilities have to be fixed? So they can also share this uh, information to the operator, so they can inform this. Um, information and uh, to help operators the better monitoring of the current situation. That if they notice something abnormal, they can also report to the, the, uh, the analyst. And so here, so for uh, increasing the cybersecurity situation awareness for the different stakeholders, so we develop the visualization for the um, and terminal operators and also the, the security analyst. So for the terminal operators view, so we, we present a holistic overview of the, uh, the situa uh, 
situational awareness of, uh, of the different devices in the upper and the field area. So we use different colors to show different like cyber, cyber security health. So here I can show you the video demo. Here is uh, on the left. It's just some uh, summary information about the the different devices and the incident. Here, just some like ranking of the top vulnerable sets. So, for, for example, if you you uh, you click on different devices, you can get more information. Like this is for the device it's being tagged, so you can get more uh, more information like there the report and also the operators can send the security issues to the to security analysts to let them know like how is the current situation. So by this kind of user interface the, the operators can get a better view about like the cybersecurity situation in the in the harbor area and also the different information for this running system and the devices. So for uh, for supporting this virtualization, uh, we developed the different data models to represent the overall security status of this endpoint. <coughs> so which can be the IoT smart devices or other like software or or other data systems. So we developed like these three data models in the security LC. Uh, we we define five levels like for the for the endpoint and uh, also the security issues which to help them, the different stakeholders, they can report any issues and uh, to exchange the information. And uh, for the security incident, we, uh, for this object, we build it on this incident object description exchange format, the LDF, LDF standard, so which is uh, commonly used for the incidence management. So we, so for those different data models, so we kind of like just uh, we uh, we define them in this basic element, like to uh, for, for example like, like this health level, and uh, also for issues we uh, we put the some basic information like the report ID who is reports these issues, and uh, for the Security instance data model. We just we just use the the basic element uh, elements to describe uh, what kind of incident is like um, how the uh, one is being detected or like that or other thing like uh, uh, additional information. So for um, so for developing those three a data model, so we choose the, so the back end, we choose this lightweight machine to machine protocol. So it's a standard for the IoT devices management. And uh, we found out it's also a good option for the, uh, for managing this security information. So there is, um, here's the overall architecture. So like for different stakeholders or companies like in the hammer or in the ferry area. So they can have their own like ecosystem or like light to a machine to machine system to help them to monitor the cyber assets or assistances in their own environment. Like those devices belongs to their own company. They can have this kind of monitoring. While the t terminal operators, they can have this uh, the overview from them, like from the harbor and the fever area to get the uh, Overall, uh, the cybersecurity healthy in this in this area, and the right side is about the workflow of the like how the security issues reporting by using those three data models. So from the um, operator operator side, if they notice some abnormal devices rating, then they can report these issues like to analyst to let to let them know to like to decide what, what the kind of problem is this. So it can be a device fault, then they, they can basically update these security issues 
object to inform the operator about the situation, or if it's a serious security incident, then they can also create the incident object, like also the, uh, to uh, report these issues, and uh, they can uh, um, update the security health level. So. Uh, uh, to inform the operators. So from that, that site, the operators' visualization will, be, will get the latest update that they will know what is going on or which part should be uh, um, required more monitoring in this scenario. So here is uh, the security analyst view, like you, the Lesha. Lesha is kind of, uh, is uh, uh, Java-based implementation of this lightweight machine-to-machine protocol, and so they also provide a web-based user interface, like for the IoT device, like for the IoT devices management. So by um, by including those three data models we develop for the for the security management, so the analyst can get the um, the um, user interface phase to do the management and uh, also uh, from the security issues object there, they can get the, some the um, inform like from the operators and they can also create the security incident and share, share this report. So based on this three data models and the system we are using in the um, we did two evaluation work. So the first one, we are focusing on the traffic exchange with this system. So we have uh, we evaluated like the, the data transmitted by the client and uh, the servers in in three payload formats. So that's three steps included in the workflow that I just showed. So it's the this step one is like the operators that created all the report on security issues. The second one is like the analyst that they confirm, okay, so this is a security incident, so they're creating a new one. And then in the last step is for this incident is uh, resolved, and so they remove these cases. So the, you know, the results we got and we found out, so compare in this three data format, the tier based kind of efficient and it mm, can be used in like constrained environment like this IoT environment. Also JSON can, mm, can it's a better option like if this system will be integrated with other like web-based systems, it's also one, mm, one, one good option. And uh, so the second uh, the second evaluation we did is like uh, we evaluated the, the incidents exchanging with this IODF format. So we created the six common incident reports. They are based on this common cyber attacks in the industrial environment. So we also uh, use the three data formats supported by this IODF, which are those uh, XML and JSON and Sable. And so we evaluate the, fi the file size for this different um, incident report. So and uh, so the results also shows like all these three formats are quite feasible. Well, well, JSON is kind of suitable for the API buildings, also the integration with other software systems. But Sable is can is especially efficient in the constrained environment, as you can see in some specific like distributed DOS tag, the, the size of the server is kind of like three times less compared to the XML. So which also makes the this format is quite useful like uh, in IoT environment. So such a standard way of exchanging the incident or reporting can also or be beneficial like for different stakeholders and uh, organizations in, in terms of cybersecurity cooperation or and uh, incident management. So our future work is also um, including way of analysis like uh, what kind of other security re relevant information we can use or is those historical security incidents there 
useful to include in this in this system. And we're also trying to integrate with other use cases like the remote heritage. We also have some cooperation with the outdoor university regarding this part. We're trying to say the method they are using for risk management can that be used for like um, evaluating and utilizing the cybersecurity risks in this uh, during the remote piloting process and uh, also um, we are we are checking the other um, utilization techniques uh, can be used in this large scale data sets scenario and the last part is also like how we can evaluate those visualization and because uh, the use case for this is like it's get people in different and stakeholders and uh, operational environment. So how we can find the effective evaluation approach like to, to validate they are quite useful and uh, user friendly. So I think this is what I want to share for, for today. Thanks. Thank you, Honey, for a very comprehensive presentation. Is there any questions from the audience? Thank you. Maybe more a comment. So now the analyst box was quite of a black box. And in reality, if you look into practice, yes. that is the very complex part. It's very hard to decide whether you have a de device malfunction or a security issue. So for a future uh, research, I suggest that if you could do looking to that and helping creating tools for making the analysis easier, that would be helpful. Just okay. a comment. Yeah, thanks. Any more questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Anni. And next we have Mika Komu from LM Ericsson. The stage is yours. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm Mika from Ericsson, and we have a, a te teamed up with uh, Tampere University. We have some participants. Anti is here. Is Bill here also? Yes, there you go. <coughs> so I will take care of the easy uh, questions, and Bill and Anti will take the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we have been doing uh, uh, in collaboration was basically a benchmarking of a kind of emulated 5G and cell, uh, uh, 5G and, uh, and uh, um, different kind of light wireless environments, basically, in in, a, in a emulated environment. And uh, here is the team, and uh, basically we have been experimenting with traffic shapers because we have an emulated wireless environment, and we use basically traffic shapers to uh, kind of do handle the emulation. And uh, yes, so uh, basically what we have in the setup or our vision is that basically that in the vessel you have one, one uh, small data, data center or edge cloud if you will. And then somewhere else like in the control, control center, center you have another data center, maybe a bigger one. And we want these to uh, these two data centers, they can be even more to operate as a like a single unit, so that uh, they they can be operated from a centralized point point of view, so from one place. But also, like we uh, I know that uh, sometimes uh, ships lose con all connectivity, so then uh, basically uh, the ship should still remain autonomous, so it can handle all local processing ab ab abroad without the help of this kind of a central uh, cloud and uh, basically this autonomous operation I will refer it to as uh, federated cloud or federated Kubernetes later in the presentation and uh, <clears throat> the challenge here is that uh, we have both cellular and satellite connectivity in the ships and that sometimes you have cellular connectivity sometimes you don't have it so you have to resort on the more expensive uh, satellite connectivity they have different latency and bandwidth characteristics. So basically, the satellite connections is it's usually quite narrow, so you cannot get so much traffic through. And also the latencies are long, longer. And 5G is, and 4G is kind of the opposite, so you have shorter latency, and you can get uh, large videos through quite easily. 
so basically, uh, when you put these together, so we have this kind of multi multiple clouds connected together, and wireless network, and sometimes uh, when the ship, when the ships are move, obviously moving, so that, uh, for example, with 5G, you will then have a varying traffic loss because of the distance uh, to the uh, base stations. So we decided to have a look at what kind of a, what is the result of having wireless connectivity and this kind of multiple clouds. So how does it work? Because usually in cloud computing, you assume that you have fixed uh, like a high-speed internet fiber connections. So how does it work if you don't have that? So that was our, our kind of uh, mission in this, these experiments. And basically we had an emulated test page, so we didn't actually use real ships in this experiment. And uh, uh, basically uh, how we emulated it, we emulated wire, wireless connectivity using wired connectivity. And how does it work? You use traffic shapers to kind of uh, bring uh, uh, traffic loss and other characteristics to the traffic. So you kind of have a, like a di digital twin, if you will, of a, uh, of a networking solution here. So this is the test bed that we used. So we had a gigabit switch and a couple of uh, uh, virtualized clusters. And then we had also one physical cluster that had bare metal Kubernetes installed there. And if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, so it's basically a new new way of doing a cloud. Uh, so basically, you, typically people talk about microservices and uh, DevOps and uh, other th things in, in the context of uh, Kubernetes and uh, usually use lightweight virtualization like containers in the context of Kubernetes. Uh, we use Network Service Mesh, which is one of the uh, networking solutions for Kubernetes. Just to name. There are others, uh, obviously, but this is, this is the one that we used for the experiments. And uh, for the sake of the experiments, it doesn't really matter which one you actually use. Uh, then we had this kind of a <coughs> link emulator here. So if this is like the ship network, and here is the control center. So there is there's like a link emulator that is basically acting uh, as if it, uh, as if this connection was uh, wireless. So basically, it's dropping some of the packets and introducing more latency to the communications. Uh, this one was based on previous and dominant. Uh, and basically, then we uh, in the experiments we were basically running a stream of TCP traffic between the uh, command center and the uh, the ship and uh, it's, it was TCP traffic and we have different traffic profiles uh, that we show here. We have some um, low, low bandwidth applications and, and a bit high bandwidth applications that we uh, dug up from the literature. And basically we had different kind of traffic profiles here. Uh, we had two different satellite uh, profiles, one like uh, low performing and a bit more high performing and for 5G the same also so we had a bit different uh, kind of traffic profiles. All of them were actually uh, from literature references so we didn't really invent them ourselves. So then we have a look at what kind of measurement results we uh, got. So if we have a look at the uh, axis here, so on the y axis we have throughput, so how much traffic gets through. And on this y-axis and on the x-axis, if you go to the right, uh, the uh, amount of uh, packet loss will increase. So we go up to 0.1. <coughs> One would be like all traffic gets lost, but we don't have it here because the uh, um, traffic tries, uh, will start to drop quite uh, drastically or already at uh, like 10% uh, uh, traffic uh, drop rate. So basically, we have this high bandwidth application here, uh, medium and low bandwidth application. And basically, <coughs> the first let figure here is that um, if we don't use actually Kubernetes, so how, how it works, so basically we had normal PCs and we were running the traffic uh, on, like, uh, on top of the uh, host operating system. And basically we can see a 
decline at uh, 0.0.6 uh, packet loss rate. And if we compare it to the Kubernetes one, uh, this one has like 5G profile on this, so it's almost the same. So there's uh, only 0.01 difference there. So from this, we kind of concluded that uh, like Kubernetes doesn't add that much difference to the actual um, uh, the emulation environment. Then we had uh, two other traffic profiles here. On the left, uh, you have uh, a one 5G profile, and uh, on the left, left, on the right, you have another profile. On the left, you have short latency, and here you have a bit like double the amount of latency. And this shows that basically, uh, because if you have low latency, it's 0.05. And here it's 0.02 when the traffic starts actually decreasing already. So from this, you can conclude that it's better to have a low latency solution, basically, because if you have a high latency, then uh, the, when you get packet loss, then uh, you will experience it already earlier, in, uh, like smaller packet loss values. And this kind of confirms the previous results. So we have here a satellite profile with a short, relatively short latency, and here high latency. And uh, we, you cannot really see the difference because it's already, already starts quite early. The traffic starts to decline. The throughput starts to decline quite early on, already in, in both of the results. So then we had another, uh, the previous measurements were done using a um, kind of an external uh, load, uh, external traffic shaper. So the traffic shaper was outside of the cloud, basically. Then we also experiment, experimented with cloud internal traffic shapers, and just to understand how, how they actually work. And uh, we experimented with two uh, different solutions, Calico and Cilium. And uh, basically, we used only single cloud in these experiments because Cilium, uh, only Cilium supports like multi-cloud connectivity. And uh, we set the bandwidth to uh, 10 mega, so bandwidth cap to 10 megabit per, per second. So basically, in all of the measurements, you should see maximum 10 megabits per second. But as it turns out, uh, on the y-axis, you have the throughput. And here you have these different uh, test runs. Uh, multi we tried it multiple times. So actually, uh, the problem was that basically, so the blue one was Calico solution. And uh, it actually lets through too much traffic in the beginning, but then it stabilizes. Whereas this Cilium has small, it also lets some traffic through initially, but then it's stabilizes quite quickly. So there's some room for improvement in this bandwidth capping of the Kubernetes internal solutions. But they, at least the Cilium one, one worked pretty well. The main issue with the Cilium one is that it applies only for outbound traffic direction. So for inbound, you need something else. <coughs> right, so to conclude, basically, we were benchmarking both cloud internal and external traffic shapers, Kubernetes cloud networks. And we got a paper accepted to IEEE uh, World Forum of Internet of Things based on our uh, measurements. And our main, pain, main findings are that Kubernetes itself doesn't add much overhead into, into the uh, emulated test bed. And if you, this is an emulated test bed, not really a simulation, so it corresponds more uh, of like a real environment. So we assume that in a real environment, Kubernetes would not have that, that much difference for uh, ship networking. Then uh, one, another finding is that when you have the higher your, the latency is, then uh, when, you, when you have packet drop or bad connectivity, then it, it, it increases the bad impact on TCP. So that was one of the findings. And uh, then we tried also these internal traffic shapers for Kubernetes, and there's uh, some room for improvement from, for them. Uh, 
as, as we showed on previous slides. Uh, as future work, we should uh, do more measurements and show how the CPU usage uh, corresponds to the network bandwidth. I would assume that it doesn't, because it was quite low bandwidth traffic, so it doesn't actually increase that much CPU usage in the cloud. Uh, then we should investigate on having multiple parallel different kind of uh, traffics uh, going through the networks. And uh, it would be really nice to do some automated traffic prioritization. So when you have a very lossy network, you could prioritize uh, like uh, mission critical traffic from the rest of the traffic and uh, give more priority to the uh, mission critical <coughs> traffic uh, in an automatized way. And uh, yeah, we hope that this, our findings could be used for uh, providing like a kind of digi digital uh, twin for networking for ships. And by that, uh, I thank you for your attention. Um, you can ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you for a very clear presentation. Is there any questions from the audience? Yeah, Vesa Martin Jepson, thank you very much for a nice presentation. Uh, my question goes more to the future work. Have you considered the uh, optimization when it comes to the uh, expenses related to data? So what would be then the, the uh, kind of a cost for the uh, end users in the, in the different kind of a setups? That's a good question. So basically, uh, like 5G connectivity is obviously cheaper. You could uh, we haven't actually thought about that. That's yeah. an interesting question. It could be actually part of this traffic profiling thing also. Yeah. Kind of my, my hint on that one is that it's not only the connectivity, but you should also have a look of the server side and the cost of it. Also, yes, yes, of course. Any other questions? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And last but not least, Henry Suoniemi from Meyer, Finland, will talk about chatbot camera and smart railway examinations. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody from my side. So I'm um, Suoniemi from Meyer, actually not Meyer, Finland, but uh, almost the same. So the city are anyway. <laughs> so uh, there has been. Uh, has been uh, uh, when, when we first uh, speak about the uh, shipyard, our role in this favorite project is a little bit different than many others because we are not uh, producing any equipment or systems or even services for this favorite. Uh, we are not uh, even using those services such, so much. We are more or less uh, observing the systems uh, uh, what uh, becomes here so that we can know what is coming in, uh, going on in the future and what we can offer to our clients later on. Uh, and the uh, other thing is uh, that we are supporting all our partners in this uh, uh, program uh, as much as possible. But then also, because there is always some kind of uh, uh, our own programs going on, so. Uh, there has been some experiments what we have done under this very umbrella when those fits very well for this. So <clears throat> uh, we have actually made this uh, type of camera system, it, it goes like that, because we have installed those uh, uh, cameras in uh, our uh, vessel within the uh, or after the launching, when that is, will be floated out from the dry dock. Not a big way, uh, uh, not long way, uh, it's uh, just about uh, three vessels length. But anyhow, it is uh, something where we need uh, this kind of uh, assistance, because uh, normally you can't see the pier side of the vessel at all, and uh, the vessel is totally dead, no power at all, the wheelhouse is empty, all the uh, windows are covered, so you can't see it out at all. So there need to be somebody standing in a pier and looking between the vessel and pier uh, how much space there is and giving the instructions to the uh, 
that boats uh, how to move the vessel. And normally that is our hubbo master Tony, so this helps uh, <laughs> his software in the future quite well. Uh, so we installed those uh, cameras to having online uh, uh, real-time video, uh, camera view, uh, transport uh, from uh, this uh, transport with the vessel to that boats and also to hubbo master in those pads. And also we are using the, this uh, uh, ALS data so that we install uh, CPR's own uh, uh, satellite compass and the AIS system on board and uh, it uses the, that same physical pilot look what uh, is normally installed on board the vessels and uh, we can use this strength uh, pilot book uh, box this uh, little red box uh, what can be connected to this, uh, this uh, same uh, pilot book and this uh, lens pilot book is same what uh, pinpoint pilots are using on board so uh, they will be get exactly same information out that uh, pilots normally get uh, from uh, vessel what they are piloting and that is then transferred uh, top of the chart and the chart is also this uh, transverse uh, pilot power chart program which is again the same than uh, pilots are using uh, and uh, in those packs, what we are using uh, is this uh, uh, chart program uh, in uh, one app. Uh, so it's, uh, um, how I say, exactly similar view what the pilots normally using. But then there is also this other uh, app so that you can change space and then get this real-time uh, camera picture there also. And uh, this we have uh, made uh, together with a uh, good partner, Whitehouse, uh, using those uh, Whitehouse smart boxes here. And uh, they uh, uh, cellular network connectivity for this. And uh, <coughs> then uh, that was in, in uh, 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 rolled out uh, in, in CPR area. But then we also use uh, this uh, almost same arrangement in C trials. Uh, and again, uh, transfer the same camera pictures and also AIS information. Only that AIS information, when we go C trial, is taken out from uh, vessel's own equipment or in that time because then everything is working or not everything. The navigation systems, yes, but unfortunately, those uh, camera systems, CCTV systems on board, the vessel's own systems normally are not yet working. And that's why we still need this uh, temporary camera system when we go to the sea trial. And uh, these images are transferred again to dark boats. It's possible to transfer on shore. But uh, here in sea trial views, we need that camera picture also in a bridge because uh, you have no visibility from bridge uh, to the vessel's uh, bottom line. So that's why we transfer the same uh, camera pictures in the bridge also. And uh, there we use this uh, big connection, which is, uh, I would say, principally more or less same than uh, Wi Fi, but uh, with different uh, frequency. Was it my Google Because this is also made uh, together with Lighthouse. <laughs> And uh, then those cameras we have also also installed uh, in the uh, other side of the vessel so that we can get the uh, image from the pilot embrace and and also from uh, helicopter winching area because those need to be visible on the bridge also uh, when we are out from the uh, open sea. And that's why we need this uh, connection because there we have no cellular connection anymore, so it's a trade connection from cameras to the vehicle. So here you can see the uh, situation. Uh, there are those uh, light bulbs uh, in top of the site, and uh, this kind of uh, view you can't see from the wheelhouse, uh, not even wheelhouse screen. So you can see this only with those cameras, this kind of uh, image. Uh, and same here when we are going out from the pier, uh, you can't see this uh, vessel's waterline and uh, side of the pier uh, from the wheelhouse. You need to use this camera view 
to see that kind of uh, image, uh, which is very helpful for the uh, captains and pilots. And uh, same here, this uh, pilot boat or, or pilot embarkation uh, door, uh, that uh, you can't see either from the wheelhouse, so there we also need to use this guy. Uh, then, uh, because uh, we are making all kind of experiments uh, under this uh, system, we have made all uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, additional experiments. Uh, in uh, There was uh, also discussed this uh, cyber security issue, and uh, this package that uh, we have used, uh, we have made uh, uh, cyber security uh, vulnerability test together with FSEGO. Uh, quite ago nowadays, but was FSEGO at that time. That was one day session, and uh, they uh, find that uh, to be very safe to use. Uh, but they will use this White uh, uh, House Mark of Cheese with, uh, with 4G connection, uh, not via satellite, for instance. So, so that has been tested. And uh, <clears throat> then also uh, we uh, tested this. Uh, there was earlier in Marcus' presentation question of this satellite connection. We also tested that satellite connection in C trial to transfer this uh, AIS data and also this camera uh, images uh, via the satellite, and it works uh, totally as well as with this uh, uh, 4G connection. But uh, come back to this latency, what was also discussed uh, here earlier, uh, we also see that uh, when the images was transferred uh, via the satellite. Uh, then there was uh, more than 20 seconds delay for transferring these uh, images uh, on shore. When, uh, uh, when, when as uh, long as we used uh, 4G connection, the delay for camera picture was uh, about uh, six seconds. It, it was even a little bit more when we uh, see that on board, because then it was first on shore and then come back on shore to on board. But uh, one way transfer, from vessel to on shore was about six seconds delay. And uh, <clears throat> you see, we, we do very professional uh, uh, tests uh, on board. So uh, like in this picture, you can see that uh, this was uh, just uh, rapidly arranged uh, test uh, to uh, have a radar picture transferred uh, on shore uh, so that it was uh, taken uh, the radar picture image uh, with the camera and uh, just transfer that camera image on shore to see how well this radar picture uh, is visible and uh, how much was this delay and they would it anyhow be usable for some kind of purposes and that was also uh, uh, recorded by the Pride House and given to the uh, pin pilot to see if, if there's any help for that. And uh, then uh, other, uh, yeah, how I say, extra experiment was this, uh, use the same cameras uh, for, uh, for more remote tension surveillance so that uh, our people who are responsible for the fixing of a vessel in the pier, uh, for instance in weekends, they can see at home if uh, those ropes are okay or if those seems to be too tight or something and they know that if they need to come again uh, in the shipyard uh, while they are uh, spending weekend at the home. So this kind of, uh, of uh, system we have used is also and find out that it works uh, fine there also. So we are using those same cameras for this system while those are not used in ship values. And uh, like they say in, in, uh, in uh, uh, TV shopping uh, channels, uh, this is not even all. <laughs> so, uh, because we have agreed uh, to continue this uh, payway uh, program until end of this year, even uh, officially this uh, program is uh, already ended. Uh, we as a shipyard, uh, we, we will still continue this uh, uh, whole this year and uh, our intention is now to have this smart paper to shipyard. So uh, there is going, uh, or not yet going, but uh, will become this stretching uh, of the shipyard paper already this year still 
And uh, that uh, happens, uh, of course, together with the Port of Turku, who, who will uh, take care of this uh, shipyard paper also. And uh, uh, in that uh, same time, we are discussing and uh, investigating what we can do. Uh, one thing is uh, replacing those uh, physical boys with uh, virtual boys. Uh, that is because uh, anyhow, when there comes uh, big uh, blocks uh, transported into the shipyard or uh, fellow units which are even bigger, those uh, uh, boys need to be removed because uh, they, uh, otherwise they can't stay there. It, it is uh, more or uh, less, uh, or, or let's say, little more precisely so in next uh, uh, picture what, what is coming on. But uh, here is also mentioned now this uh, uh, camera what is already installed in shipyard uh, uh, light uh, uh, mast. Uh, and uh, this is so that uh, it takes the picture for this uh, fairway. And uh, there should be um, added these uh, fairway lines in the top of that picture. And uh, that is uh, one uh, development project uh, which uh, we are uh, doing again together with the White House, who is our good partner in all of these, these kind of systems. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, meant to transfer also in those uh, bags what is using, uh, what the dogpals are using, so that uh, 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 they have already, uh, at, let's say, uh, in, in those uh, dogpals who are uh, transporting those big ferro units uh, in the shipyard. The ferro units have already uh, transponders in each uh, corner of the unit so that they can see exact location of that ferro unit top of the electronic chart. Uh, then they could get uh, the, also those, uh, uh, in the future, those uh, work virtual boys, and then maybe also this uh, uh, camera picture with uh, very well so, uh, so then it should be quite uh, good uh, uh, assistance for those uh, uh, dark boat uh, captains and uh, pilots who are who are bringing these uh, systems or those blocks and and ferry units into the shipyard. And uh, <clears throat> here you can see the the problem what we have because this is very narrow. This uh, CPR fairway, and uh, when we have a big uh, uh, cruise vessel in our outfitting pier, this is this uh, red vessel there, uh, it is uh, so huge that uh, uh, when there comes as wide block or ferry unit into the shipyard and should be transferred into the dock, which is this lighter blue area in upper uh, side, uh, then we need uh, really to uh, remove those boys and uh, even then the uh, the ferro unit or block unit will go a little bit out from the from the fairway so uh, the, any kind of help for those uh, two boat uh, captains is uh, very welcome to see where uh, those blocks and ferro units really are and uh, to see also how close to this uh, vessel uh, which is in uh, out outfitting here, those are because this vessel is not visible in those electronic charts. Even even the uh, fellow units are visible there and also these boys. And here you can see also this uh, red spot where is, uh, uh, this uh, light mask where this camera is already installed. And uh, there is already installed also uh, the weather station even not mentioned in this uh, presentation and uh, also this uh, better data from that weather station uh, should be available in all those uh, uh, packs what is using by harbor master and pilots and uh, two port masters so this kind of things we have uh, we have uh, done in a shipyard so this is our who has them? And, uh, and uh, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, need to take place because uh, we are uh, building these big cruise vessels and uh, these big uh, cruise vessels are so that delivery of uh, next one will be still this year, but there are more and more coming 
we are fully booked uh, until the year 2026. So that's all what I supposed to show to you. And uh, uh, there is no room for questions. Or of course, I think it's next coffee break. So <laughs> even better location. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any questions? I trust that this was open presentation. No questions. <laughs> okay, on my, my, my behalf, I'd like to thank all the presenters and the fine audience we had today. Next, we have a coffee break of 30 minutes, and we'll continue in this room with the ethics and human factor session. So, if you are participating in Future Fairway, it will be in the next room. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.